gratification. These are sins of self-indulgence. We steal because we think we should have what somebody else has. We swindle to get what we cannot fairly earn. We violate God's standards for sexual behavior because we are sexually starved or because we think we were made a certain way. We were born a certain way. Or just because we want it a certain way. Getting back to this, we have to accept God's judgment. Can I get an amen? amen. See, God's judgment on the people who live like that is clear. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. They won't go to heaven. Simple, clear, direct, to the point. It's easy in our present situation to apply only those things that offend us. But Paul's concern was bright, was much broader. Swindlers, not going to heaven. Abusers, not going to heaven. Adulterers, not going to heaven. Thieves, not going to heaven. Drunkards, not going to heaven. Immoral people will not go to heaven. And why should they? Wait a minute, I'm going to say it again. Heaven is not for people who live their life in sin. Heaven is for people who have been forgiven of their sins. And someone who's been forgiven of their sins should not remain in their sin. What did Paul say? Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. So, should I remain in my sin so that grace can abound? Heaven forbid. Well, wait just so you know it does. Amen? Amen? But we think we have to stay there. Paul does not mean to suggest that a Christian cannot commit one of these sins. That they're, 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 it's no longer possible for them to do this. And just to be clear, if someone says to you, you know, I just don't sin anymore, let me tell you oh, what. <laughs> they're lying. Watch for their pants to go up in flames. There you go. Because <laughs> Jesus says, if you say that you don't sin, you're a liar. The truth, the truth has been removed. It's not in you. Remember what I said earlier? If you remove the truth from the, from the Christian faith, if you remove the truth, you've taken away its power. So the first step to being healed this morning from your system, from the, the damage that has been caused from sin and actually being delivered from sin, the first step into being healed is accepting God's righteous judgment on your sin. God says that you're a sinner. You're a sinner. You deserve something less than heaven. You deserve hell under condemnation, facing eternal judgment without hope in the world. And if you agree with God's judgment, or do you wish to argue with it, as long as you argue with God, go on, as long as you argue with him, and you cannot be saved, and you will not be changed. So we have to agree with God's judgment. And the church said, agree, agree, said amen, right? Amen. Next thing is, we must believe in God's power. There's power, power, wonder work and power. Do you believe that this morning? I mean, in some ways, this is harder than the first step. As difficult as it is to accept that you're a sinner deserving judgment, it's much harder for a lot of people to truly believe that God's power can change them. And that's why the first phrase in verse 11 is crucial. Paul reminds the Corinthians that God had radically changed their tenses. What I mean by that is who they were at a particular time. You once were this. Some of you were drunkards, but not anymore. Some of you were adulterers, not anymore. Some of you were abusers, not anymore. Some of you were swindlers, everybody? Not anymore. Some of you were homosexual. Not Some of you, listen, here, here's the truth that's liberating and sobering. Not everybody will be changed. But everyone could be changed. And to believe anything opposite of that is to deny the power of God. Hello? You see, I'm talking about real hope for lasting change. Some will choose to live their lives in sin. Others will rebel at the thought of change. They may at least resist and not run the other direction. Others simply will not believe that they can be changed. And so they will stay the way they are. And some of us are like that in the church today. We just stay the way we are because we think we're good enough. 
just so you know, none of us are good enough. But there's still hope because we can't be changed. Amen? You see, the reasons why people don't change, well, I guess they're probably as varied as there are variable personalities. Amen? There's all, there's all these little things, but it is finally true that not everyone will come to Jesus for salvation. That's true. Not everybody's going to come to Jesus. Not everybody's going to be converted. But everyone could be saved. Can you agree that this morning? Everyone could be saved. The blood of Jesus has more than enough power to save the entire world. No one who comes to him would ever be turned away. So the Bible says, you come to him, he'll not turn you away. There is no sinner beyond the reach of God's grace. And, and there is no sin so heinous that God cannot forgive it. And the forgiveness is not about overlooking it. Forgiving it is about throwing it aside and changing the person to the point where it's as if it never happened. This is our great hope. The reason that we send missionaries all around the world, the reason that we have churches, the reason that I serve here, the reason that we should want to come here is because we want to see the move of God in our lives, in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in the world. This is our great hope, the reason that we send all these people around. Everyone could be saved, and everybody needs salvation. So the gospel is this power of God, right? The gospel of Jesus, it is the power of God unto salvation. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Underline that score, whatever. Because the gospel of Jesus is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And that's without exception. You say, well, pastor, I know so-and-so, and they still do this and this and this. And I'll tell you what, that's because they don't believe in salvation like God, like God tells us. They skip the first part. God is able to save completely and forever those who come to him. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. You can, he hits them. He's going to save you to the uttermost. He's going to, you will be sealed. And the idea here is that we've got to come to this next point. We must believe in God's power and then also <coughs> come up. We must claim God's promise. Paul now explains how great in verse 11 that the change takes place. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Holy Spirit of God. Come on, Church of God. Can you reach out for the Holy Spirit this morning and say, Holy Spirit, come? Now, in the Greek word, but actually occurs three times. It says, but you were washed. What's this? This is an argument. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified. In other words, there's an argument going on. There's an argument, I can't, you know, I, I can't help myself, I can't give this up, I can't stop doing this, I can't stop thinking like that, I can't stop doing this. And he says, stop right there. Yes, you can. Because you were washed, but you were sanctified, you were justified. It's Paul's way of emphasizing this remarkable change that happened to those people a couple thousand years ago in Corinth. And it can happen here in New Buffalo, in Michigan City, in the port, and all around the town. Amen? Amen? You were washed. When your clothes are dirty, what do you do? You put them in a washing machine. You add some detergent. Turn that washing machine on and come back in 40 minutes or so. What happens? You take your clothes out, the dirt is gone, and the clothes are clean. Now you transfer that image of Jesus. Transfer the image of the blood of Jesus. Before you came to Christ, your life was dirty. Your life is unclean. And when an unclean life is washed in the blood of Jesus, spotless. Do you believe that this morning? What's that? Well, how did that them go? Um, there is a fountain filled with blood. Drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. How many will lose those stains? You say, I'm a pastor, I can't forget, and other people won't let me forget, but don't stop. Yes, you can't forget it. If you just push towards the mark and high calling in Christ, you can't forget it. You know, that's the power 